President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, was indicted Thursday by special counsel David Weiss for lying about being on drugs while purchasing a gun in 2018. Yet Republicans aren't satisfied. They want to impeach Hunter's father on allegations the president benefited from his son's business dealings. Never mind that there's absolutely no, zero evidence of wrongdoing. But when it comes to profiting from White House ties, look no further than Donald Trump's own family, his daughter, Ivanka, and son-in-law, Jared Kushner. They may be the poster children for questionable family business. In 2017, during Trump's first year as president, China granted more than 30 trademarks to companies linked to his daughter, Ivanka, who was serving as advisor to the president, raising concerns about conflicts of interest in the White House. Then, only six months after Trump left the Oval Office in 2021, his son-in-law and former senior advisor to the president, Jared Kushner, secured a $2 billion investment from a fund led by the Saudi crown prince, despite objections from the fund's advisors. Joining me now, Congressman Robert Garcia, member of the Home, Homeland Security Committee and the House Oversight Committee and president of the Democratic freshman class. Also joining Kate Kelly, investigative money, influence and policy reporter at The New York Times. Thank you both very much for coming to the Saturday show. Congressman Garcia, what concerns you most about Jared Kushner's two billion dollar investment from Saudi Arabia? Yeah, good morning. I mean, look, it's it's very concerning. I mean, I think the facts are really important here. Uh, you have Jared Kushner, who we know that essentially ran Middle East policy uh, in the Trump White House. He uh, was a big part of why the first secretary of state, as we know now, uh, left the White House. Um, and then he bit, essentially put together this huge arms deal with Saudi Arabia, uh, about a $110 billion arms deal. Uh, he's very involved. And then, of course, two months after the Trump White House ends, he starts getting $2 billion plus directly to his company, which is completely outrageous. So this is something that must be investigated. How does Jared Kushner get $2 billion two months after leaving the White House, mm. at the same time knowing that he was critical and the lead advisor to the president, Donald Trump, his father-in-law, when it came to Middle East policy. So this is something that I think is really important for us right now to focus on. Uh, the Kushners have clearly, in my opinion, broken serious laws here. There's massive ethics issues. And this is, in my opinion, the biggest political scandal right now in modern politics. We have to investigate mm -hmm. the Kushners. And, and Kate, in your reporting with David D. Kirkpatrick last year, you noted that Kushner got the investment despite objections from the fund's advisors. What were their concerns? They had a number of concerns, uh, Jonathan. I mean, they, they thought uh, there was inexperience on the executive team. They essentially thought that the sort of pitch book that Team Kushner had put together to talk about what they would do as an investment firm was kind of thin on the ground. They were they were concerned about headline risk. I mean, there were a whole battery of things that had that advisory panel to the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund wondering whether they should just pass. Mm. And Kate, what can you tell us about Ivanka Trump? and questions about how she she may have benefited from her role in the Trump White House. How'd she get those trademarks? Well, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the trademarks in China. I mean, basically, in every way, this was such a norm-shattering presidency in terms of bringing family members into the White House, as my colleague Peter Baker noted again recently. Um, I mean, the idea that she was still obtaining trademarks for her clothing and accessories line, the idea that Jared Kushner was having dealings with international figures who were his counterparts, for example, on working on the Abraham Accords, which was a truly path-breaking international accord uh, in the Middle East, but at the same time, so shortly after office, you know, he ends up doing business with some of those players. I mean, what's tricky is um, he at least is sort of playing into a loophole here. I mean, this is not strictly against the law to, after you leave office, obtain investment money from one of your former counterparts. Where it would get into illegal territory is if any of that was discussed or there was any sort of a quid pro quo while he was in office. And mm. not to speak for Congressman Garcia, but I know uh, Democrats on the Oversight Committee have been keen to get further information about that period of time and how the whole thing was set up. And obviously, with the politics being what they are now, uh, the chairman of the committee, James Comer, has not been open to that. Well, actually, Congressman Garcia, that anticipates the question I was going to ask you. So, you know, earlier this year, Congressman Jamie Raskin, the ranking member on the uh, Oversight Committee, sent a letter to Jared Kushner renewing committee Democrats' request 
for documents related to his investment firm. What's the latest on that, especially since that investigation that got started when Democrats were in control stopped once you were out of control? Right. I mean, first, let's let's also review what James Comer actually said. I mean, Comer actually said that he thought this crossed the ethical line and that Kushner actually crossed the ethical line. And so I think that the, the calls for him to actually open this investigation um, are warranted. And I think uh, Jamie Raskin is absolutely right. We should be investigating this at the Oversight Committee. Uh, right now, there's completely stalled. There's no action moving forward, but we're pushing every single day to bring attention to this issue and to force House Republicans to open this investigation. The, and the critical thing that actually is, I think, so maddening is that the hypocrisy on the House Republican side is enormous. Here you have them every single day going after the president's family. A person who, by the way, is going through the justice system right now, did not work in the White House, uh, had no direct business connection or zero evidence with any wrongdoing to the president. And yet that's going through the process and they're focused on that every single day, yet they refuse to even investigate or ask questions or get documents, or we're asking for a subpoena, by the way, of these documents, to someone that actually started receiving billions of dollars to their company two months after leaving the White House. Then this person actually worked in the White House. And so it's it's huge hypocrisy. Uh, we're going to focus. We're going to push every single day. But the public needs to know that this is a serious, serious issue, and we're going to find out and get to the bottom of it. You know, Kate, in, in your report, I mean, as a fellow journalist, uh, I know that when you do lots of reporting, you know, some things get either left off because you haven't, you don't have it all yet to put it into a story, uh, or stuff gets cut for space. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just wondering, what is there more to the business dealings done by Jared Kushner and his wife Ivanka Trump um, that the American people need to know about? but they don't know about it. Yeah, I mean, I could speak more to Jared, Jonathan, because I've studied him more in my reporting. I sure. mean, I do think there's a lot of unknown. I mean, J Jared Kushner has traveled to Saudi Arabia and other parts of the Middle East on a number of occasions, both in and after office. He is known to have had a close personal rapport with Prince uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and, you know, WhatsApp exchanges, for example, with uh, Prince Mohammed about, I'm sure, a variety of issues. The other thing that's important is um, Kushner was somewhat of a... A, um, an, an advocate for the Saudi relationship while in the White House and, for example, helped to encourage the president, President Trump at the time, to sort of tamp down the response to the Jamal Khashoggi murder mm -hmm. um, and to carry on with that relationship. And as the congressman mentioned, you know, was instrumental in putting together that more than $100 billion arms deal with the Saudis on the occasion of the first state visit to Saudi Arabia in 2017. So obviously it would be great to shed a light on his interactions with the crown prince and what was said, whether there was any talk about future business dealings, even a veiled discussion of that, uh, but also what role he played in the sort of soft diplomacy between the Trump administration and the Saudis. I mean, as we all know now, it, it's a very potentially pivotal relationship in that region. And especially now that we're talking broadly about the possibility of a normalization deal between Saudi and Israel uh, with the U.S. involvement, I think that's something the Biden administration and, and some in Congress would very much like to see. Um, so it's a crucial relationship under President Biden. Obviously, it had a much rockier start. And um, what the Trump administration chose to do with that and making them such a pivotal partner was interesting and obviously had benefits down the road. What we don't know is whether the groundwork was laid for that during the administration. And the one last thing I'd add, I'm sorry I'm going on, but um, you know, it's interesting to note that this investigation Congressman Garcia was talking about started under Democratic leadership, under Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney in a prior Congress. But I, and my understanding is that even then, the documents that were asked for were not really furnished. The ones that were produced weren't super relevant. So it's been a grind, I think, to get transparency here. Um, we're, we are over time, but this is a conversation I am very interested in having again. Kate Kelly of The New York Times, Congressman Robert Garcia, thank you both very much for coming to The Saturday Show. And after the...